It's a pleasure to introduce our today's speaker, Rob Phillips. Uh, Rob Phillips is a professor in Caltech and basic professor of both physics and biology, is that right? Mm -hmm. uh, so he is most famous for his books, one of which is known to everyone who took the class in biophysics. And I realized today that students who took the class and viewed this book you didn't know that this is uh, the same person. So this is the person behind uh, this uh, big book, Physical Biology of the Cell. But I have to tell you that there is a newer book, which is just big fun to read, which is called Cell Biology by Numbers. You can learn lots of amusing things, and it's done with a beautiful taste for sort of fairly problems how to estimate this and that and that in biology. Very nice. I have it uh, on my nightstand next to my bed and uh, it, it, it keeps me uh, not sleeping for too, too long a time. Uh, so he is extremely knowledgeable man. I have to tell you that in my experience he read everything and this is, and finally I learned from him how this happened. He told me once that he didn't like to attend the school and instead he would climb on the tree with a, with a bag full of, of books. He would hide behind the leaves and sit there and read. That's how you can become somebody knowledgeable. I don't know if you, if you still do that when you are a professor in Caltech. I think it's a good idea. <laughs> so, with this introduction, I think we can listen to what he has to say. Thanks. Actually, that reminds me of an amazingly good book by Italo Calvino. I don't know how many of you have read it, but it's called The Baron and the Trees. And it's basically about a guy who spends his whole life in a tree. And I wish that were true, that I'd read like that. Uh, this introduction makes me think of something Bilbo Baggins said. He said, I don't know half of you half as well as I should like, and I like less than half of you half as well as you deserve. <laughs> okay, so you can puzzle over that. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna talk about something that I'm really very excited about and hopefully will amuse you. So the plan of the talk is a little bit neurotic sounding, and the, the plan goes like this. I wanna start out by trying to describe what this word allosteri means and why people in a physics audience should find it interesting. And then what I'm gonna do is give you three examples of the allosteri concept in play. The first one will be related to something in neuroscience, which is ion channels. Then the second one will be how it is that cells turn genes on and off. And then the last part will have to do with what I would like to call biological specificity and I think really links to ideas like Maxwell's demon. And again, I think um, these, these are all interesting examples of what in the end is only one story. So, you know, uh, my, my view, I've, I asked the students today and I like to ask everyone about attendance at colloquia. So when I was a postdoc at Cornell, uh, that was in the late 80s, uh, everybody went to physics colloquium every week, basically. And what I found is that nowadays, I would say probably less than half of all of us go, at least in many institutions, go to colloquia anymore. And I feel, you know, maybe I'm wrong, but I just feel that somehow the talks aim too high in some sense these days. And one of the worst ways to give a talk, in my view, is to talk about more than one thing. So what am I gonna do? I'm gonna talk about four things. So, uh, but really it's, really, it's one story. So I wanna start with a famous video, which probably many of you have seen before. And what this is, is basically a cell from our immune system in a field of red blood cells chasing down a bacterium. It speaks for itself. So what's going on there is that the cell is clearly detecting stuff in its environment and as a result of that detection, it's actually making decisions about where to go next. And so that video basically, as I say, that car basically that video begets a cartoon 
which is shown here, and the details are completely irrelevant. I don't want you to focus on the details. There's just two words that I want you to notice. There's the word sense, which is right there, and then activate, which shows up three different times. So the point is, is that somehow the cell senses something in its environment, and then in light of that sensation, it activates something else. And so what I want to ask is, how is it that this sensing and activation takes place? What does that actually mean at the level of molecules? And if you like, if I try to use physics language, is there an Ising-like model that describes that. When I say eyes, I don't mean specifically spins, but what I do mean is an elementary statistical mechanical description that carries weight, that allows us to do things that are unexpected, like connecting magnetism and melting. That, to me, is, in a certain sense, unexpected. So um, the, the idea really goes back to this paper, which is from 1963, by Jacques Monod, shown here, and Jean-Pierre Changeau, and Francois Jacob. And the paper was a response to a mystery. And the mystery was that people were realizing, he referred to what this discovery as the second secret of life. Just out of curiosity, what do people imagine the first secret of life is? Yeah, so that, that, would, be, that would be definitely one candidate. How, how many people actually don't choose that as number one, the, the main secret of life? I don't. So I would put evolution as a higher secret of life than DNA. But at any rate, that's what Mono had in mind. We're talking 10 years precisely after the elucidation of the structure of DNA by Watson and Crick. And so he basically went home and he told his wife, actually, that he had discovered the second secret of life. And it was this idea that proteins could undergo conformational change between states of different activity. And the reason this was so interesting is that people knew about feedback. And what they thought is, let's say there's a place where all the action happens in a molecule like, like this. So in other words, this guy comes in here, and then it gets acted upon. The idea that people had at that time was that feedback meant that there had to be a second molecule that fit in the same place and turn it off. And that's, these guys started to get worried that that was too many coincidences. You'd have to have substrates and inhibitors that were shaped the same way, and their big insight was that you can poke here and something will happen there. So in other words, there's two different sites where the action takes place. So what would something have to do to qualify as a secret of life? So um, I was talking to the students uh, uh, right before the talk, and probably an even more interesting example of this is teaching freshman biology at Caltech. So every kid at Caltech has to take uh, three or four terms of physics, and three terms of chemistry, and three terms of math, and then some biology. Probably not in your era. I don't think the biology was in the core. But um, it's very interesting, because when I teach the freshman biology class, we take a poll. And it's a multiple choice question, which is, the proposition is, I'm excited to be in the class. A, very excited. B, you know, moderately. C, not such a good idea. D, this is the worst class ever. It's a delta function on D. People do not want to be in this class. And so why? I asked them. And the answer is because AP biology seems to have been an exercise in memorizing names of molecules and pathways and so on. And they've been deceived into thinking that it's not a subject endowed with deep principles and wonderful phenomena. Crazy, in my opinion. So when I say what must something qualify, do to qualify as a secret of life, what I mean is what are the guiding principles? In other words, in physics, we often, there's certain, the way that I've heard it said is we have certain superpowers. Like if you know how to do the harmonic oscillator, for example, and a few other things, you can get a lot of mileage out of that. So what are the superpowers in biology? So one of them is this interesting idea of homeostasis, which is in some sense I would think of as like Le Chatelier's principle in disguise. Paul Nurse, uh, probably when he was just up the street, actually, was going around giving uh, this lecture on the great ideas of biology, and he tries to give a sense of what some of the secrets of life are. You know, the, the living organisms are made of cells. The unity of biochemistry. Everybody uses ATP. Everybody uses the same genetic code, and so on. And evolution. And the case that I'm going to tell you about is this case of Alistair. So I'm going to try to give you a sense of what this is all about. So Alistair, in a word, is the idea that the macromolecules of life can exist in two states, inactive and active. It's that straightforward. 
This is an ion channel, so you can see that it's closed, which is inactive, and then it's open. Here's an enzyme, it's not cleaving a substrate. Here it's in a different conformational state, and it's cleaving a substrate. Here's the receptor, it's not doing something on the cell interior, namely phosphorylating something, inactive and active. And then in the context of gene expression, a molecule can either bind DNA or not, depending upon the presence of some inhibitor. So how did I come to this obsession? So um, it kind of has two parts. The first part had to do with working on exactly this book that Sher was mentioning. And uh, my, my friend and co-author, Julie Terrio, was telling me about this strange model that had been used for hemoglobin. So just to appreciate this, let's all take a deep breath. So, so what we just did is we saturated the hemoglobin molecules. In other words, if you were to look at the occupancy of hemoglobin with oxygen, I take a deep breath, almost all the molecules are like 90% saturation. The oxygen then is delivered into my tissues where the partial pressure of oxygen is lower. The hemoglobin undergoes a conformational change like this when it binds uh, oxygen. So when we were writing this book, I started to notice there were all these very distinct biological problems that seemed to use the same model. And as it happened, in 2013, there was a 50th anniversary meeting to celebrate the discovery of allosteria in these two classic papers. This is the one where they articulated sort of in words what allosteria is. And in this paper, they basically wrote down the statistical mechanical model of allosteria and used it for a few test cases. So at this meeting, it was kind of one of these weird meetings where you see how many Nobel Prize winners you can collect. I just, for my own reasons, had to look at my notes this weekend. There were 10 Nobel Prize winner people, you know, a bunch of gray hairs. Uh, but it was very, very impressive when I looked through my notes at all the different things that were talked about. So basically, we had some people talking about neuroscience and ion channels. We had a whole cast of people talking about cell signaling and surface receptors. We had different people talking about gene regulation. This is hemoglobin. We also had people talking about ribosomes and so on and so forth. And really what, what occurred to me was, wow, that really captures broad swaths of biology. We've got neuroscience, physiology, motility, gene regulation, the central dogma, biochemistry, metabolism, all of these things are implicated. And what that made me think about was, wow, this, it seems that this Alistair statistical mechanical model kind of gives me the same vibe as I have when I think about things that at first very much surprised me when learning about physics. So some of you might recognize this graph from the really cool chapter in the Feynman Lectures on Physics on resonance. There's a, one of my favorite chapters in those books is on resonance. Why? Because Feynman points out all the different ways that resonance rears its head. And so, um, you know, this is sort of a mod modern uh, optical resonator, but I'm hoping, how many of you recognize this lake? I'm hoping nobody. So good. This is Lake Wakatipu. This is a lake in New Zealand. It's one of about three lakes on the face of the earth that has a permanent sesh. A sesh, S-E-I-C-H-E. -E. It basically has a tide. And here's the data. So they have, they have three measuring devices at different places. And basically, this thing sloshes with about a 54-minute period. Completely mind-blowing. You can actually, if you search on it on Google, you'll find people give homework problems. You can estimate what the period is, and you'll probably do reasonably well. The part that I find really tricky to think about and that I uh, have been challenging some uh, freshmen at Caltech with is what drives it. Very interesting. We can come back to talk about it later. But I'm impressed by the idea that whether you're talking about transmission of light or optical resonators or pushing your kid on a swing or you know, session a lake, it's basically the same physics. And a second example that I find also uh, very amusing is uh, interference. So uh, why am I bringing this up? I'm bringing this up because I'm intrigued by something that I didn't expect when I first started studying physics, which probably for all of us is way too far in the rearview mirror to remember how cool it is. But we were talking about it a little while ago. Harmonic oscillator, mass spring, and RLC circuit. How in the hell did that end up being the same thing? Well, interference is, is an even cooler one in some ways. So it turns out, I only learned this very recently when I read a biography of Thomas Young, um, one of the first places that this was thought about was by Newton in the context of tides in the Gulf of Tonkin. 
So you might remember the Gulf of Tonkin is, is modern day Vietnam, but already in the 1600s, the British were going there and there's basically the captains kept ship logs and they said, oh, you gotta be careful here. And I know this very personally. So um, when I was 17, I was on a sailboat. We sailed 3000 miles. And when we got to Costa Rica, the Costa Rican government forced us to bring a pilot onto our boat in Punta Arenas. It's a 100 foot sailboat. I was on the crew of this thing. The, the pilot came onto our boat and proceeded to run us aground. I kid you not. We had to get our Boston whaler out, wait for the high tide, and push our boat off of the thing. But so pilots care about stuff like tides a lot. So the British pilots were saying this is a super weird place because unlike everywhere else, it does not have two high tides and two low tides every day. It has one high tide and one low tide. Completely bizarre. And so Newton made a first go at this. Thomas Young made a go at it, actually. And while he was thinking about this, then he started thinking about beats in the acoustic setting. This is a figure from Newton, from optics, and this is the table from Thomas Young. He's the first one to basically figure out the colors in a thin film. Here's his work, and this is sort of the modern version of it. And then this is the figure from Thomas Young's rather long tome, as you can see by figure 442. First time that the two slit experiment shows up. So why am I bringing it up? Because interference is bigger than any one example. And what I'm gonna talk about today, if I ever start talking about it, is something that's bigger than one particular biological example. So uh, in keeping with my Lord of the Rings theme, uh, this is the one equation that rules them all, okay? What I'm gonna try to do is explain to you where this equation comes from and why it is so, in my opinion, so powerful. The point here, this is just kind of a joke, in some ways making fun of the idea of phylogenetic trees, but in another way being very serious about phylogenetics intellectually. Again, if you think about how you organize freshman physics, people argue about this. So, you know, should we do mechanics and free body diagrams and then we do something else separately? Or how do we organize things? These topics in a biology book, ion channels, hemoglobin, uh, G protein coupled receptor, nucleosome, they're gonna be 500 pages apart from each other. They are not the same topic. And yet, from the standpoint of this equation, they are literally the same in the same way that RLC and harmonic oscillator are. Okay, that's enough philosophizing almost. Just one last thought. So, um, so I wanted to comment on uh, what I think is a very fun take on the power of using mathematics, not only in, in, uh, in biology, but everywhere. And this is from uh, James Black, and this was in his Nobel address. I'm just gonna read it to you. Black used mathematical models on the road that led to the first beta adrenergic receptor antagonists or beta blockers and in his lecture for the 1988 Nobel Prize in Physiology or Medicine, he crystallized his understanding of them in a way that nobody has ever bettered. Models in analytical pharmacology are not meant to be descriptions, pathetic descriptions of nature. They are designed to be accurate descriptions of our pathetic thinking about nature. Just substitute systems biology for analytical pharmacology and you have it. Okay, so I think that's very powerful and very important. The math allows you to take the cartoon and to be formal about what you think it actually means and take it all the way to the finish line. At the end of the day, if it's inconsistent with the experiment, then you know the assumptions that led to the math are suspect or the experiment wasn't right, but I, I'm not gonna worry about that, um, that side of it. Okay, so with that background, what, let me now give you an example. The first example has to do with ion channels. So what you see here is basically a muscle fiber and then this is a nerve connecting to the muscle fiber, which will lead it to the twitching that you know, I'm doing right here. And this is a cartoon that schematizes what happens. This is the, basically the, the nerve along which an action potential runs. This leads to the release of neurotransmitters from these vesicles. So these guys, the little red circles, are the neurotransmitters, acetylcholine in particular, and what they do, as you can see here, is they bind to the ion channel and open it up and that leads to a current flow across this membrane and a change in the membrane potential of this next cell. There's no acetylcholine bound here, so this guy's closed. There is some bound there and that one is open. So uh, ion channels are membrane proteins. If you look at the data on the permeability of membranes, in other words, if you ask the question, if I take a charged particle, what's the chance that it will cross a cell membrane? The answer is it's very, very low probability. But the beauty of a biological membrane is that it can become transiently permeable 
by virtue of the presence of these membrane proteins that will open up temporarily and allow the passage of charge. The point of the diagram is to illustrate that there are many different ways for us to perturb or to talk to these channels, including applying a voltage, binding of a ligand, or the application of membrane tension. All of those are schemes for gating an ion channel, and I'm going to talk about the middle ones, which are the ligand-gated case. So here's two examples. So this example, acetylcholine, this is exactly the one that's in our, the interfaces between the neurons and our muscles that get gated in response to the arrival of an action potential. These, the cyclic nucleotide gated channels, are present in our olfactory system and also in our, in our eyes, in our photoreceptors, in the context of vision. In both cases, they open up in the response to a binding of a ligand. Uh, just to give you a little bit of a sense of how people do experiments on these, the idea is that you take a little patch of membrane. So this is a pipette you see here, it's schematized. Let's say it's about a micron in diameter. You grab a little patch of membrane, and now this thing, you, you have an electrode, and you measure the amount of current passing through this thing as a function of the driving force, such as membrane tension or voltage or amount of ligand. And this is what a current trace looks like. So basically, the current size is uh, something like uh, picoamps, and the duration of the opening events is on the order of you know, tens to hundreds of milliseconds. Down, open, and up. And and unfortunately, uh, yeah, unfortunately. I, I'm not a big fan of that, but that's, that's the way it, in this particular data. Yeah. So, uh, so this is an example of the kind of data that I'm going to try to walk you through and to, and to reflect on from the point of view of this model. So what's plotted here? This is the current passing through the channel as a function of the amount of acetylcholine. So when you have very little acetylcholine, there's no current. And when you have a lot, there is current. The difference from one of these to the next is that they're mutants. This is the wild type channel. And then this is making a particular amino acid change. And this is another change. And that's another change and yet another change. And my question is, you know, how do we think about this? So using the statistical mechanical model, let me just skip that. Um, you know, you, the, the first temptation might be to say, well, I know how to do statistical mechanics on a two-level system. It can either be closed or open. The energy of the closed state, I'll call it E closed. The energy of the open state, I'll call E open. That means Boltzmann tells me how to find the relative statistical weights of those two things, and I compute the probability of being open. But what's a little lame about this diagram is that it doesn't tell you how E open and E closed get coupled to the driving force. I don't have any measure of the external world talking to the channel. So here's an example. This is a more concrete example of what actually happens. So I claim that there are eight microscopic states available to the system, which I will act out. So here's the two binding sites. The channel is closed. It can be unoccupied, occupied here, occupied there, and doubly occupied. And then it can be open, empty, occupied there, occupied there, and doubly occupied. That's eight states. So um, this is a perfect, in my view, uh, qualifying exam. <laughs> Uh, type question because you can write down the statistical weight of these states. So notice here that I'm saying that the energy of this guy is zero. And then if I bind one guy, I take a particular ligand out of solution. That's the chemical potential. Um, on, in the open state, notice that there's a different energy. This thing has an energy epsilon when it's open. And the binding energy is also different. And that's the most important thing. So let me just say that again. This model had a very subtle idea. Binding in the closed state and binding in the open state do not have the same binding energy. Okay, that's critical to this. And that's also true of hemoglobin. Hemoglobin in, our, in my lung, when it's in this shape, it doesn't like to bind oxygen. When it's in this shape, it does like to bind oxygen. So it, it undergoes a conformational change. So at the end of the day, if I'm interested in P open, what do I do? I put in the numerator the sum of all the open states, which is that. And in the denominator, I put the sum of all the states. So there you go. That's the one equation that rules them all. To my mind, this is, I, I'm gonna, I assert, uh, primarily just because it's fun to hear alternatives, but I assert that that is the, probably the most far-reaching model that I'm aware of in biology, honestly. I, I'd be happy to hear other ideas, but as far as I can tell, that's, uh, that's the one. And it's very interesting that this equation tells the story. Now, let's just review what I said. I converted from uh, microscopic binding energies here to KDs. KD is telling me about the propensity to bind. 
Notice that the binding in the inactive state and the active state is different. And if the KD and the kappa D were the same, the stuff in parentheses would go away and there'd be no concentration dependence. It wouldn't gate. It's a very, very interesting point. So you can use this model basically, uh, in some sense this may seem like a fit, but what I'm, uh, I'm going to assume is that for all these mutants that I just showed you, the only parameter that changed is epsilon. So in other words, this is a one parameter family of curves. And the part that I think is most intriguing about it is, uh, you know, the, the notion of a mutant is a very interesting idea. Um, it's interesting from many different points of view, like for example, disease. You know, you could have a single amino acid change and that could be the difference between life and death, sickle cell anemia and not. So that's very impressive. And it's easy to be tempted to think of every mutant as its own intellectual adventure. But what I'm showing you here on this right-hand curve is actually it's a one parameter family of mutants and they're all different only by different values of this parameter epsilon, which I'm going to refer to as the Bohr parameter, and maybe now I should say, who is Bohr and what am I talking about? So Bohr, the Bohrs, as I'm sure many of you know, uh, are one of these uh, weird families, kind of like the Bernoullis, where you have many, many generations of scientists. And it turns out that uh, Niels and, and uh, Harold Bohr's father, Christian Bohr, shown right here, was a very famous Danish physiologist. And he worked on hemoglobin in particular. So here's the sort of the ribbon diagram structure of hemoglobin. Notice that there's four heme groups. That's the four slots where oxygen binds. That's the heme group. And his discovery, one of his many discoveries about hemoglobin, was the, what's now known as the Bohr effect. And the Bohr effect is the shift in these curves with pH. It's very important, actually, to the way hemoglobin works. And it's related to stuff like when your muscles feel tired when you're exercising and lactic acid, it's your ability to carry oxygen and also to take it away. So the shift in these curves is the so-called Bohr effect. And what I'm trying to tell you is that this family of curves can be data collapsed in the same way as this family of curves. And it's a one parameter family and I, I like calling it the Bohr parameter because that's the first example that was kind of known. Okay, so that's, that's the end of my first little vignette. So I want to now, what appears to be change gears. I'm going to talk about a completely different example, but as my friend Joe Blitzstein likes to say, the nouns change, but the verbs stay the same. This is really like, okay, we did mass springs, now let's do RLC. Okay, that's really the way I want you to, yeah, please, yes. Yes. Hmm. Yeah, yeah. So, um, so what I would so the question really focuses on the the mechanism that drives gating, and what I would say is that this is this is an area that I think people have not thought that carefully about, especially with respect to mechano sensation. But what I do know, and in fact, McKinnon at um, at uh, Rockefeller up the road has actually worked on the coupling between voltage gating and me mechanical tension. In other words, what, what I would say, this is really a theorist talking, I'm going to tell you a prediction. Any channel which leads to a change in the thickness of the membrane, even if it's voltage gated or chemistry gated, will have a mechanosensitivity. It cannot escape having mechanosensitivity. And they've started to explore such things. So if I understood your question correctly, you're asking about coupling between diff different driving forces. And the, the case that I would say is that the voltage and mechanics version is the one that people have started to flirt with a bit. Are there any other questions? Yeah. So if, just a comment. Uh, another assumption in this model that's very important, which is reflected in the square in your formula, is that the two sites are independent. Absolutely. Conditioned on the global state. Yeah. And they're only coupled through their Yep. So let, let's, let's actually touch on the point that was just made. It's a very fun point, actually. And this is qualifier problem number two, actually, I think. Um, so the, the observation is that this two right here is going to become, it could become a four, or I shouldn't say it could, it does become a four for this channel, because there's four binding sites. But he's absolutely right that the way that I wrote these weights is assuming that the binding here and the binding there are completely independent. Interestingly, though, 
this thing still has a sigmoidal binding curve. What I mean by that is that it behaves as though it's cooperative without any explicit cooperativity. I love that about it because it's tempting to think that cooperativity is strictly when the guys interact. Now, when I say my second qualifier problem, it's completely, I hate to use the word, but trivial to just put in the interaction energy in this guy. You can add in a plus epsilon int here. It will, not, it will no longer be a su super beautiful expression, but you can include it. It will increase the number of parameters by one, and uh, you know that's fine. And I think that that's the kind of stuff that's an interesting question to ask you know, if you drill down on mechanism. But I'm definitely a fan of this independent thing, to be perfectly honest. Good, good point. Anything else anyone wants to ask? We have all day. <laughs> I really don't have to get through anything. Okay, so, um, so now what I want to do is I want to talk about the cell as a decision-making machine. All right? So, uh, the bottom line is that cells of all kinds make decisions about which genes are on at which times and in which places. And I'm going to focus on the bacterial example. Oh boy. Um, and in a way, what I still find to be one of the coolest things I can imagine, which is you start at 8 p.m. with 5 mLs of clear liquid that has uh, basically some glucose and it has some phosphate and it has some, uh, some ammonium salts, and 24 hours, eight hours later, you'll have ten, five times 10 to the ninth cells in here. You inoculate this with a single bacterium, and eight or 12 hours later, this thing will be completely opaque, and there'll be, there'll be uh, five billion cells present in here. So what's going on is basically the cells are drawing those chemicals from the environment, and they're synthesizing biomass. And what people like Monod did is, this is from his thesis actually, is he measured what's called the optical density. So you shine some light through the solution and you basically are measuring how opaque it is as a function of time. This is in hours. And what I want to comment on is, uh, in a way, the Pasteur sort of thing, chance favors the prepared mind. Monod was intrigued by this shoulder in the growth curve. And what that shoulder has to do with is the fact that there are two different carbon sources. So, you know, you could think bagel and uh, donut. So there's two different carbon sources, and they've conspired the system so that the amount of glucose is insufficient to grow all the way to saturation. And what he noticed is that there was this sort of lag time while the cells did something before they started growing on the second carbon source. And so this led him to another one of his classic discoveries, which was the idea that there are genes that get turned on in response to environmental signals. And so uh, the point in going from here to there to there is that the ratio of the two sugars is changing. He's saying, ah, if I make a 50-50 ratio, then where this shoulder will occur should shift. And if I make it two to three or three to one or whatever, he, you know, he went through all these different kinds of progressions. So what came out of this effectively was a truth table. So just a little background. The idea, all of you I'm sure are used to the idea by now that, uh, that a bacterium has say five million A's, T's, G's, and C's strung together in its genome. There's around 5,000 genes, each of which starts with what, I'm gonna represent it by one of these little arrows. And the way the gene, what it means for the gene to be on is that the little molecular copying machine runs along the gene and makes an mRNA molecule. And what these guys, Jacob and Monod, realized is that this gene, which is used to digest lactose, will only be on when there is no glucose present and there is lactose present. If there's no lactose, the bottom one, it's off. If there's glucose around, it's off. It's only when there is lactose and no glucose that it is turned on. And so that's implemented at the molecular level by a molecule known as a repressor. So you should think of this as a molecular bouncer. It sits on the DNA and says, don't come here, you know, closed for business. This is prokaryotic, but you know, we, the notion of activator and repressor I think is solid enough in, even in that setting. But there's, yeah, there's more bells and whistles there. So how would you think about this problem using statistical mechanics? So, um, so the, the simplest idea might be to say, well, the rate at which I make new mRNAs is proportional to how often this blue guy, the molecular copying machine, is on the gene, and 
how often that happens can be given by my Boltzmann weights, okay? And so what I'm interested in is the probability of this state. So the probability of the gene being on is this weight divided by the sum of the weights. And, um, and so I just, I need to say a few words about how one could go about testing the kind of statistical mechanical treatment of gene expression. Well, what I'm plotting here is how much the gene is turned off. So notice when I'm at full change of one, that means I'm expressing my gene at the normal amount. If full change is unfamiliar, this is the perfect time of year to talk about it. So, if you measured your mass on October 31st, you probably had a mass of something or other. Mine was 100 in kilogram units, like almost perfectly. Now, I arrive on January 2nd. I stand on the scale. My mass will be 103 or 104, unhappily. So to construct the fold change, what I do is I take the ratio of mass January 2nd, divide by the original mass of 100, and that gives me my fold change. So it's activated because of holiday eating. Here, the repressor leads to a reduction in gene expression because when the repressor is around, notice this axis. As I increase the number of repressors, that means they're sitting on the gene closed for business. So more repressors means less gene expression. And what I want to just say a few words about before I can sort of bring us back to Alistair is how one would go about testing this kind of theoretical prediction. Thanks, Shira. So, um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to walk you through one of the ways we've thought about it using fluorescence. And actually, uh, I heard a great thing about uh, David Greer's Physics 1 course today, um, which I want to tell you because I totally agree with what you said if you said it. Uh, you might be like Yogi Berra, and you, maybe you didn't say what you said, but... <laughs> yeah, okay. So uh, apparently, I don't know where he is, but some... Ah, there you are, yeah. So uh, in Phys 1, you told them something along the lines that, uh, that in physics, it's all about counting. And I really subscribe to that because with entropy, you know, we're always trying to find clever ways to count, but also experimentally, it's really, really hard to do this, which is count repressor molecules. I need to know how many there are. I have a cell. I want to know how many molecules there are. I don't give a damn how red the cell is. That helps me zero. I do not want A dot U units, which is maybe not so much a disease in a physics department. But I don't mean kill astronomical units. I mean uh, kill arbitrary units. So, uh, yeah, yeah, that was a close one. So, um, so this is actually one of my favorite stories, and I don't know how many of you remember the name Davis Sobel, but she wrote that book, Longitude, and she literally, this week, just came out with a new book called, the, I think it's called The Glass House, and it's about these women. The Glass Universe. I'm already halfway through it, and I'm loving it, and it involves one of my heroes, who is Henrietta Leavitt. So notice, by the way, this is like 1910 at Harvard. These women, that's called Pickering's Harem, Sorry, but that's what it's, the, uh, Pickering was the head astronomer. But I want you to notice this right there, this data, which is roughly speaking that. So Henrietta Leavitt, the, basically the, every evening they would take pictures, and he was very interested in photometry, and he was trying to figure out that, and basically the magnitudes of stars. And her discovery, you know, I'm not going to go into any sort of detail, but what, what she did is she realized something very interesting about the Cepheid variables, which was there's a relationship between their luminosity and their period. So here you see an example of changes in luminosity, and then this is basically the modern version of uh, the Cepheid variable curve. And for my purposes, the main thing that I want to say about it is that it's a standard candle, and I love that notion. Okay, it's a standard candle, which means that you can figure out how far away those objects are. And what we need is a standard candle for counting fluorescent molecules. So I've got all these molecules, each of which is carrying around a little light bulb. The problem is I don't know how bright a given light bulb is. I don't know that at all. And so I want to figure out how to calibrate this thing. And so there's this beautiful paper from Nitzan Rosenfeld and John Young when they were grad students with Uriel Alon, Peter Swain, and Michael Elowitz. And I, I hope that you, you all will love this because it's such a cool example of yet another thing. It took me until I was like 45 to understand, which is the binomial distribution. There's so many clever things that come back to counting. 
So here it is. We're going to do an experiment with these four right here. Okay? If you were born on an even day, please raise your hand. How awesome is that? No, no, just these four. Okay, now we're going to do these four right here. If you were born on an even day, please raise your hand. Okay, so now we got two. We're going to do these four right here. Born on an even day, please raise your hand. Okay, so we got two again, so let's, I don't know. You see the point. Here's the point. These, if I have four molecules and the cell divides, there's going to be a coin flip. Every single molecule is going to flip a coin. It's either going to go right or left. And so what that means is there are going to be fluctuations in the intensities of the two daughters. And so by examining the difference in intensity of the two daughters, we can actually learn something about the absolute number of molecules. How? If I make the assertion, which I hope you'll grant me, that the total intensity is proportional to the total number of molecules, there's an unknown coefficient alpha. A little binomial ology leads you to this very simple result. The difference in intensity of the two daughters squared is proportional to the intensity of the mother. Really, really cool. So now let me show you how you'd implement that. So here's a movie. We start out at t equals zero with red cells. No more red is produced. Every cell divides, and so the redness gets diluted. I'm going to show you the movie again. So the red cell, they're dividing. The redness is diluted out. When the redness gets diluted out, that means that the red is no longer turning off the green, so the green gets turned on. So green comes up as red goes down. Every one of those cell division events is a point on this graph. So what's plotted here? This is mom's intensity. Okay, so this point had this intensity in the mother. This is the difference in intensity of the two daughters squared. Every data point is one cell division. So basically, this line is an average over all of that, and what you see is the calibration factor, 156 arbitrary units per molecule. So for this particular microscope setting, I actually know how to convert between number of molecules and... Um, and, this, uh, uh, and the intensity. The slope of half or something? Do I remember what the slope is? Uh, it depends. I think it should be one, but I don't know off the top. I think it should be one, but can, you, can we look afterwards so I don't have to think on my feet? Uh, I'm sure I can figure it out relatively quickly, but I don't want to do it while you're watching. I don't know how many of you feel that way, but it's, yeah, okay. So, um, so the net result of all this is that these curves are predictions about how much gene expression is reduced as a function of copy number of the repressor. The different curves correspond to how tightly the DNA binds the protein. If something binds more tightly, I don't need as many of them to get the same oomph. Okay, so the four curves correspond to that. All right, this is really just background to being able to tell you about the actual thing that we did. Uh, well, that, we did that previous thing, but the thing related to allosteric. So it turns out that there's a knob that I can tune to change gene expression other than changing the number of repressors. So here, notice the knob that we controlled was number of repressors. But a different way to do this is I could just put in a chemical that makes the repressor fall off. That's a sort of easier way to do this. This was terrible. This, this was really a mess and hard. So without going into the details, because this is what I mean by the nouns change, but the verbs stay the same. This is the same diagram I already showed you. Now it's a transcription factor. It's a protein that binds to DNA. This is the state that can bind DNA because it's flat. It can bind the DNA. This state doesn't like to bind DNA. And this is where the so-called inducer binds. And, you know, that's... That's that. In other words, we, we have exactly the same equation that I wrote down before for how the gene expression is affected. If you want to talk about details, I'm happy to. But let me just say a few words about what the consequences are. So one of the things that you can observe is that if I, uh, if I change the number of repressors, the curve for the, the, basically the amount of gene expression as a function of the chemical that makes the, the repressor fall off the DNA will be different. So notice, this is when I have tons of repressors around. What's the interpretation of this? It means that even if I put in lots of the chemical that binds to the thing and makes it fall off, I have so many of them there that they still bind. 
because I've got enough of them around that I can still bind. Um, here you can see that I've got very few copies of the molecule and so once I put in a little inducer, they, they, there's not enough of them to keep the genes turned off. And then here what I'm showing you is what happens is I increase the strength of the binding site. So uh, I don't know, maybe that's too much detail, but the bottom line is that we've done uh, a bunch of experiments to try and test this kind of thinking. And we've used both microscopy and a very clever gadget called a flow cytometer. I don't know how many of you have looked at one of these before, but basically you can measure hundreds of thousands of cells in you know, half hour. Uh, it's a fluorescence scheme. And basically what happens is we measure the level of gene expression as a function of this chemical. This chemical makes the repressor fall off. Um, so that's the data I just showed you. We can use the model that I just wrote down to determine all the unknown parameters. There's three parameters in this model. What are they? How tightly it binds in the inactive state, how tightly it binds in the active state, and the difference in energy between those two states. I'm saying we fix those parameters. There's no free parameters left. So now I predict what happens as I change the number of repressors. I predict what happens when I change how tightly the DNA binds. And this is where I ask the audience a question. Uh, this is the result. So let me ask, here's the question or comment followed by question. And you guys can maybe answer me at dinner or whatever. So, so it goes like this. There's quite an obsession these days with p-values and statistics. And I often tell people that almost no law that I really like and care about depended upon anybody doing a p-value or statistics. And so, you know, there was no p-value for the inverse square law. There was no p-value in Coulomb's paper. There was no p-value on Ampere's law. There's no p-value in Maxwell on viscosity and density dependence. Like, the list is very long. And what I, so my question to the audience is when do we say theory and experiment are in agreement? And so, so just to remind you, I'm, I'm making the following claim. That is the fit to the model, the orange thing. There are no free parameters left. We just think we know what's going on. There's all the predictions, that's the data. So for me, you know, doing a biology experiment, I feel in some sense like I want to beat my chest and say, yeah, that looks pretty good, I'm pretty excited. But then, you know, there's lots of stuff to consider. Uh, you know, like if you look at the blue and the green guys, in all cases, they're a little weird. I have some thoughts about that, about previous experimental errors, because it depends on how well we know the number of repressors and so on. But I'm especially interested in like the condensed matter experiment people. You know, when we do a theory experiment interplay, I'm just very intrigued by this notion of how do we decide that we're satisfied. Okay, I'm, maybe I'm sounding incredibly naive and stupid, and I apologize if I do, but, but uh, I actually think it's, for, at least for me, it's a very deep question, and I hate this idea of just saying, oh, and by the way, the comparison between theory and experiment is really nice, or, you know, it's good, or it's excellent. Um, but, you know, in, what, in some ways, maybe I'm being like uh, Karl Popper and wanting to falsify, and I'm saying we don't falsify, we tend to see that things are consistent. And I'm not sure what the next predictions are to break the model, if you will. Okay, anyway, that was enough of that. Uh, I think I'll skip that, but just say that once again, using the Bohr parameter, this is basically tons of different strains of bacteria that have nothing to do with each other. They're separate molecular biology experiments and so on. And only one of them, which is this guy, was used to determine three parameters. And everything else is just that we, to some extent, think we know what's going on. Okay. So I'm going to give one last vignette, and I'm not going to really do it justice, but I just want to quickly say what the words are. So, um, so you probably know that DNA gets turned into RNA through RNA polymerase, and then RNA gets turned into proteins through the process of translation. And what I wanted to comment on was the fidelity of this process. And I love this article by Tanya Baker. And let me tell you in, in my words what she says. What she says is that if the DNA copying machinery, if DNA were this tall, if DNA were a meter in diameter, then the machine that copies it would be the size of a FedEx truck. It would be traveling at 500 kilometers per hour. It would be making a delivery on both sides of the street every 10 centimeters. It would finish its day's work 
in 40 minutes and it would make a mistake once every three years in terms of delivery of a package. So just you know, put that in your pipe and smoke it. I mean, that's, that's incredibly impressive, fidelity. The DNA copying is really, really high fidelity. So I could show you the movie, but so you know, that's, that's her point. So you know, it's basically making these deliveries, traveling 500 kilometers per hour every 10 centimeters, both sides of the street, and doing this every day uh, and making a mistake every, once, every three years. If somebody's reading this and you see over here that I don't seem to agree with her, that's because she wasn't including proofreading, and I am, because the real system does proofreading. Uh, okay, so this is a representation of what we know about the data. Replication is very high fidelity. That means 10 to the minus 10th error rate. Translation is like 10 to the minus 4. So uh, just a quick comment as to what my point would be is if you tried to use thermodynamics to estimate the error rate, how would you do that? You'd ask the question, how often does the right guy get recognized and how often does the wrong guy get recognized? You could actually just by counting up, once again, counting hydrogen bonds, you could figure out what the error rate would be. And you'd get like one in 100. Thermodynamics by itself is insufficient. And so, you know, I'm not going to go through it, but you can, you can work out the error rate. You get something like order 100. Um, what do you mean thermodynamics itself is insufficient? I mean, well, what I think I'm, a real living system mm -hmm. and... I guess what I'm trying to say is that equilibrium sure. binding, yeah, of course. Uh, I'm trying to say that equilibrium binding of tRNA and its mRNA is not sufficient. Energy is invested. That's what I mean. In other words, because you could imagine that the molecular recognition by, in and of itself was the thing. And I'm saying it's, it's more than that. And, it, and the thing that I think is so cool is this idea of energy investment. And so without going into too many details, let me just uh, say that John Hopfield and independently Jacques Ninio had these very interesting papers on what the, is now referred to as kinetic proofreading. And I really don't have time to go into the details at all. But the key point is that, as I was just saying, energy is invested. And the connection to my little Alistair story from today, and I, I am going to just leave this dangling, is that you can actually use the same MWC model that I just mentioned, but here I've got a sort of mechanical analog of ATP hydrolysis where I do work on the system and I can prove how much specificity I get based on how much work uh, I do. So, you know, we could talk about that. I'm not going to belabor it. So, um, so what have I told you? So in the, same, in the same spirit as everything is a harmonic oscillator, I've tried to make the exaggerated claim that everything's an MWC molecule, a mono wyman schranger molecule. I showed you two examples. I showed you this one, which is the ion channel and its associated data collapse, and I showed you the lac repressor, or transcription factor binding, and its associated data collapse. Ned Wingreen and Bonnie Bassler with SWEM and SWEM in the context of quorum sensing did an exactly similar uh, example. There's a very interesting example having to do with nucleosomes. I'm trying to say that I find it quite provocative that the one equation presides over all these very different things. Um, this is probably just a bit of a rant, but it's just to ask you to do an estimate or two. So one estimate would be if you were, how much time, if you spent the rest of your life looking at all the known X-ray crystal structures of molecule, biological molecules, how long would you have to look at each molecule? It's just in a way asking to what extent do we buy into this idea. If you look at science and nature every week, in my opinion, every week there's two or three more crystal structures of this or that molecule. And I guess I'm in some sense just asking, like, you know, what's this all about? Where is it headed? And it kind of makes me think of these two very distinct rants. I hate this one with a passion, and I highly recommend you read it tonight. It's by Chris Anderson when he was the editor of Wired Magazine. The end of theory, the data deluge makes the scientific method obsolete. The message was, if you just statistics it enough, you can figure out the correlations and that's it. And, you know, I think I'm not allowed to use the kind of actual natural Southern California surfer boy language that this makes me want to use. This is, uh, this is Sidney Brenner. I'm much more on board with this. I'm going to just read you the first paragraph. Biological research is in crisis. This was for the 100th anniversary of Alan Turing. 
And in Alan Turing's work, there's much to guide us. Technology gives us the tools to analyze organisms at all scales, but we're drowning in a sea of data and thirsting for some theoretical framework with which to understand it. Although many believe that more is better, history tells us that least is best. We need theory and a firm grasp on the nature of the objects we study to predict the rest. So, you know, these, these models, what I, what I find fun, this goes back to this notion of pathetic thinking. The pathetic thinking, when mathematicized for this model, gives you this. Those are hypotheses. If you don't like it, tough. You know, that's what the model says. So you go out into the world, and if that's not the, will, the world is, then we know that it's not an allosteric model in the sense of the way people think of it. But this is not slippery you, it just is what it is in some sense, and so I guess I'm preaching to the choir about that. So um, just by way of acknowledgement, the, in some sense, my talk is really just a groupie talk. Uh, I'm a groupie of Leonid Mirny and Ned Wingreen, who are the guys who got me to think about this model especially. And um, I, these, are, these are the people that did the experiments that I showed you, which I think are, are really fun. Um, Tal Anav is the guy who, along with Sarah Marsden, did the, the theoretical stuff. And I guess I would just say that I love coming to uh, NYU and to your soft matter group. It's just a, a privilege. I actually have talked about you guys at Caltech in our physics staffing committee. <laughs> so um, thanks for the opportunity to be here, and I'd be happy to take any questions. Yeah, I, yeah, okay, so th this is a bit of a practitioner's point and can lead to another rant, <laughs> but it's a very interesting point that he raises. There's like five criteria for the original model, oligomerization, symmetry, preservation, all this stuff. I personally think all of it's a red herring. I think it should be in our rear view mirror and no longer discussed. But I will tell you, in 2012, one of the main people that writes about or works on G-protein coupled receptors basically regurgitated all of those things, claiming that that's what it means to be an allosteric MWC thing. I totally do not agree with that for the reason that I showed you, which is you write down the states and weights. If there's only one binding site, there's no question about symmetry and whether or not it's sequential. Um, the, the, if you have an oligomer, it is interesting to ask, does, is it concerted or does one part happen at a time? But you know, there again, I find that that's, that's a debate with hurt feelings from the 1960s that's not worth keeping because the stat mech is roughly the same. In other words, if I were to give a homework, I could give part A is do the mono Wyman change, part B is do KNF, and, and part C is WTF. You know, like who cares? So, um, so, no, but I'm, I'm really serious. I, I think that it's, it's a frozen in time debate, but people are still debating it. They're still very uptight about it. I know that very well from that meeting, and I also still go see Change every time I'm in Paris. So people still care, but I don't. <laughs> okay. I have actually a question about this counting the square root of n. Yeah. I think the, the slope there is one, but that, that, that's not my question. Okay, uh, thank you. In, in the movie that, that you show, mm -hmm. in fact, what happens is red color not only gets diluted, it gets to the periphery. It gets to what? To the periphery of your, of your field of view, oh. to the boundary, which, which suggests to me that somehow this inheritance of red is not independent. You see, it's, it's only on the boundary. Oh, you know what? That, I don't think that that's redness, actually. And, and in fact, I mean, your, your powers of observation are keen. And we now, this is, notice this is many, many generations of division. It's very hard for us to segment the images, meaning to find the cells. But also, do you see all that glow? Basically, what happens is that the, these bright cells are on an agar pad. And we know for a fact that the light is going in there and then coming back out and it's really messing up the measurement. So now we, only, we, we start at different amounts of red, and then we only let it dilute once or twice. I don't think there's any funny business about what's going on at the edge. We, and I should also say, I mean, we've tested this binomialness 
by looking at the, collect, the connection between cell size and intensity. And what I mean by redness. So what I mean by that is that you might have thought that, uh, that the larger, yeah, there's a little bit of a, a different. Yeah. So the thing is. The bigger cell may be closer to the periphery and the more cell in the middle or vice versa. I don't know. Maybe we should take it up at dinner. What I was going to say is that the proteins are bound to the DNA. And so there's, there's no asymmetry in that sense. In other words, bigger cells and smaller cells have the same genome. So they're carrying along, on average, the same number of proteins upon division. So I really do think it's a coin flip. I don't know. I, I don't think there is funny business at the edge, but you know, it's something we should talk about more. Yeah, coin flip may be banned coin. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I wonder if you've done too good a job of motivating your model because I'm having a hard time sort of seeing like where it would fit. Or like, you know, if, if you were speaking to a practitioner who would say, you know, that model is too simplified, it can't cover my etc. Yeah. Yeah. Let me give let me give you one example from molecular motors that's very quick, which is a molecular motor. When people they do, for example, fret measurements, and so they can look at the conformations as a motor is walking along, and it's not a two-state thing. So you know, it's in other words, the model is really very much a two-state mentality. Now, kind of it's similar to my answer earlier, though. It's, it's very easy to imagine, and people like Michael Fisher have done so, you say, okay, I don't, I'll get rid of the two-state and I'll do a four-state model. Of course, you proliferate parameters, and it, maybe this comes back to my earlier question about how do we know when enough is enough. You know, this theory experiment thing is very, very tricky once you start generating, you know, tens or twenties of parameters. Then it starts to get quite ugly and also hard to know how to declare victory, at least to me. I mean, I'm not very excited about having 100 parameters. No, no, it's, it's totally important, and it's actually implicit in the sense that when I wrote those states down, um, I'll tell you what, you could actually, if you really wanted to write it in that kind of language, you could write a function, E of sigma B and sigma uh, confirmation. So what do I mean by this? Sigma B will be 1 if I'm bound to a ligand, and it'll be 0 if I'm not. And this will be 1 if I'm in active state, and it'll be 0 if I'm not. And you could indeed write explicitly. You could write this as a function. It's a sum and stuff. But I'm just asking, like, if you look at this, uh, notice, you know, here, this guy has energy 0. And here, the only energy that comes in is epsilon b closed, which is the energy that I get when I take this red guy and it is attaches to the Velcro on the seat. You know, in other words, it's got Velcro on its butt, and it sits down, and, and now it's stuck with an energy epsilon B closed. This guy has an energy epsilon B open. The mu's are just telling me, hey, you took an, a ligand out of solution, and so you change the entropy of solution the usual way. And then that's it. Those are, that's all the parameters. And I'm saying all that could be captured in this, but it feels like even though we did it in our book, and I kind of like it, it feels gratuitous in the sense that I think it confuses people. Like, why did you write it? it you're exactly right. It's the Hamiltonian. But I feel somehow pedagogically it's more transparent to just say, those are the states. And the rule that you carry around in your mind is that every time you bind a ligand, it has a certain energy. And that energy depends on whether you're in the active or the inactive state. Does that yeah, answer? But, but they're equivalent. Yeah. 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 So, right. And interestingly, even if I had four binding sites, it would still, then I would have to, then I would have to have one of these variables, you know, for each of the sites. 
right? So I'd have, a, I'd have sigma B1, sigma B2, sigma B3, sigma B4, and then I'd have one of these, which is just, is it active or inactive? Yeah. Shall we call it a day? <laughs> well, people want to give some, some equipment upstairs, so... Okay. <laughs>